All right, welcome back to our last session on our boy Beowulf. We are doing part two of Beowulf and the Final Battle, and we're picking up on page 177 of Seamus Haney's Beowulf. So go ahead and open up your document and scroll down to page 177. We are beginning on line 2631. And if you remember from last time, Wiglaf was the only warrior who hadn't run away. Everybody else uh, who was watching Beowulf fight the dragon, Beowulf's shield was failing, his sword had failed, he was enveloped in flames, and everyone else who's watching runs, except Wiglaf, right? He stays, and he looks at Beowulf, and he thinks of everything Beowulf has done for his family, and he shoulders his shield, and he pulls out his sword, these like ancient family weapons that he's never used before because he is completely young and never been in battle. But he sees his lord in battle, and he's going to go help. But before he goes, he's going to have a go at those men who just ran into the woods. You ready? Okay, picking up on 177 at the bottom. Sad at heart, addressing his comrades, Wiglaf spoke wise and fluent words. I remember that time when mead was flowing, how we pledged loyalty to our lord in the hall, promised our ring giver we would be worth our price, make good the gift of the war gear, these swords and helmets as and when his need required it. He picked us out from the army deliberately, honored us, and judged us fit for this action, made me these lavish gifts, and all because he considered us the best of his arms bearing thanes. And now, although he wanted this challenge to be one he'd face by himself alone, the shepherd of our land, a man unequaled in the quest for glory and a name for daring, now the day has come when this lord we serve needs sound men to give him their support. Let us go to him, help our leader through the hot flame and dread of the fire. As God is my witness, I would rather my body were robed in the same burning blaze as my gold giver's body than go back home bearing arms. That's unthinkable, unless we first have slain the foe and defended the life of the prince of the Weathergeats. I well know the things he's done for us deserve better. Should he alone be left exposed to fall in battle, we must bond together, shield and helmet, mail shirt and sword. And he waded the dangerous reek and went under the arms to his lord. Okay, so he's turned around and he's yelled at all those guys. He needs us now. You swore you'd help him. Let's get your act together and get in here. And they don't. So he goes in on his own and through the smoke and the fire. Go on, dear Beowulf. Do everything you said you would when you were still young and vowed you could never let your name and fame be dimmed while you lived. Your deeds are famous, so stay resolute, my lord. Defend your life now with the whole of your strength. I still stand by, I shall stand by you. That's great, right? Like, come on, come on, we can do it. After those words, a wildness rose in the dragon again and drove it to attack, heaving up fire, hunting for enemies, the humans it loathed. Flames lapped the shield, charred it to the boss, and the body armor on the young warrior was useless to him because metal is either going to melt in this fire or it's going to become so hot that it's actually harmful, right? But Wiglaf did well under the wide rim. Beowulf shared with him once his own had shattered in sparks and ashes. So remember that shield of Beowulf's that was melting? Beowulf is holding it up, so Wiglaf is underneath. So even as he's being attacked, Beowulf is protecting this young warrior who is standing by him. Okay? Because his shield was wooden and it just went to ash. Inspired again by the thought of glory, the war king threw his whole strength behind a sword stroke and connected with the skull. The nangling snapped, that's his sword. Beowulf's ancient iron gray sword let him down in the fight. It was never his fortune to be helped in combat by the cutting edge of weapons made of iron. Yeah, this is like the third battle he's been in where weapons were no good, right? 
When he wielded a sword, no matter how bloodied or hard-edged the blade, his hand was too strong. The stroke he dealt, I have heard, would ruin it. He could reap no advantage. So they're not blaming the sword. They're actually saying Beowulf was so strong that he just broke swords, like you do. Then the bane of that people, the fire-breathing dragon, was mad to attack for the third time. When the chance came, he caught the hero in a rush of flame and clamped sharp fangs into his neck. Beowulf's body ran wet with his lifeblood. It came welling out. Next thing they say, the noble son of Weostem, this is Wiglaf, saw the king in danger at his side and displayed his inborn bravery and strength. He left the head alone. But his fighting hand was burned when he came to his kinsman's aid. So he's, he's fighting with the sword and he's trying to avoid the dragon's head, but he gets caught by the fire. He lunged at the enemy lower down so that his decorated sword sank into its belly and the flames grew weaker. So Wiglaf gets a good stab in the belly of the beast. Once again, the king gathered his strength and drew a stabbing knife he carried on his belt, sharpened for battle. He stuck it deep into the dragon's flank. Beowulf dealt it a deadly wound. So Wiglaf got the stomach, which seems to be where the fire comes from. So he dimmed the fire so Beowulf could get close, and Beowulf stabs it up under the ribs and gets its heart. And, and he's killed the dragon. He st uh, they had killed the enemy. Courage quelled his life. That pair of kinsmen, partners in nobility, had destroyed the foe. So every man should act, be at hand when needed. But now, for the king, this would be the last of his many labors and triumphs in the world. Then the wound dealt by the ground dweller earlier began to scald and swell. Beowulf discovered deadly poison separating inside of him, surges of nausea. And so, in his wisdom, the prince realized his state and struggled towards a seat on the rampart. Okay, so it's not because he's bleeding, he's poisoned. And so he's not feeling well and he finds a place to sit. He steadied his gaze on those gigantic stones, saw how the earthwork was braced with arches built over columns. And now that fane, unequaled for goodness with his own hands, washed his lord's wounds, swabbed the weary prince with water, bathed him clean, unbuckled his helmet. So Wiglaf is bathing Beowulf. He's trying to clean up his wound. He's taking his helmet off now that it's safe. He's trying to make him comfortable and to, to take care of him. Beowulf spoke. In spite of his wounds, mortal wounds, he still spoke, for he well knew his days in the world had been lived out to the end. His allotted time was drawing to a close. Death was very near. Now is the time when I would have wanted to bestow this armor on my own son, had it been my fortune to have fathered an heir and live on in his flesh. Okay, so he, he's like, this, was, this is when I'd give my own son my armor, but I don't have a son. For 50 years I ruled this nation. No king of any neighboring clan would dare face me with troops. None had the power to intimidate me. I took what came cared for, and stood by things in my keeping, never fomented quarrels, never swore to a lie. All this consoles me, doomed as I am and sickening for death. Because of my right ways, the ruler of mankind need never blame me when the le breath leaves my body for murder of kinsmen. So when he dies and he goes to judgment, he's never going to be accused of like starting battles just because he wanted to and getting his people killed. He did everything he could to protect his people and bring peace. Go now, quickly, dearest Wiglaf, under the gray stone where the dragon is laid out, lost to his treasure. Hurry and feast your eyes on the hoard. Away you go. I want to examine that ancient gold. Gaze my fill on those garnered jewels. My going will be easier for having seen the treasure, a less troubled letting go of the life and lordship I have long maintained. Okay, this seems kind of weird coming right on the tail of what he just said. Like he was just like, I, I was a good king and that consoles me even though I know I'm going to die. Now, go get some of that treasure so I can look at it before I die. That's, that, 
that feels like it doesn't go together. But remember, what are the kings always called? Ring giver, treasure giver, right? If you're not constantly at war with your neighbors, then you're not constantly raking in that treasure, right? You get that when you defeat other people in battle. So in order to have the rings and the money and the gold and stuff to give to your loyal thanes and be a good king, right? It needs to come from somewhere. And if you're not having constant battles, where does it come from? So the thing with this gold is that Beowulf knows that it is going to stabilize his kingdom when he's gone. Like whoever takes over after him is still, is not gonna have to go to war to get treasure to reward loyal people. Like they're gonna have it and it will stabilize his kingdom. Okay, also it's pretty, but the stabilization is, is the bigger thing. And so I have heard the son of Weoston, Wiglaf, quickly obeyed the command of his languishing, war-weary lord. He went in his chainmail under the rock-piled roof of the barrow, exulting in his triumph, and saw behind, beyond the seat a treasure trove of astonishing richness. Wall hangings that were a wonder to behold, glittering gold spread across the ground, the old dawn-scorching serpent's den packed with goblets and vessels from the past, tarnished and corroding. Rusty helmets all eaten away, armbands everywhere artfully wrought. How easily treasure buried in the ground, gold hidden however skillfully, can escape from any man. And he saw too a standard, remember like a flag, entirely of gold, hanging high above the hoard, a masterpiece of filigree. It glowed with light so he could make out the ground at his feet and inspect the valuables. Of the dragon, there was no remaining sign. The sword had dispatched him. Okay, so the dragon's body like disappeared. Just like the other times where he fought and it cleansed the land. By killing the dragon, he's cleansed the land of that evil. Then, the story goes, a certain man plundered the horde in that immemorial hoe feeling filled his arms with flagons and plates, anything he wanted, and took the standard also most brilliant of banners. Already the blade of the old king's sharp killing sword had done its worst. The one who had for long minded the horde, hovering over gold, unleashing fire, searching forth midnight after midnight, had been mown down. Wiglaf went quickly, keen to get back, excited by the treasure. Anxiety weighed on his brave heart. He was hoping he would find the leader of the Geats alive when he left him helpless earlier on the open ground. So he came to the place carrying the treasure and found his lord bleeding profusely, his life at an end. Again, he began to swab his body. The beginnings of an utterance broke from the king's breast cage. The old lord gazed sadly at the gold. Isn't that great? A good ketting, his breast cage. His, he can barely catch his breath. And here, Wiglaf's all excited, I'm going to go back, but he's also worried, like, will I get back in time? And when he gets back, he's barely in time. And this is Beowulf's, kind of his last speech. To the everlasting Lord of all, to the King of glory, I give thanks that I behold this treasure here in front of me, that I have been allowed to leave my people so well endowed on the day I die. That's how we know that this is about his people's security. Now that I have bartered my last breath to own this fortune, it is up to you to look after their needs. I can hold out no longer. Order my troop to construct a barrow on a headland on the coast after my pyre has cooled. It will loom on the horizon at Hronis and be a reminder among my people, so that in coming times, crews under sail will call it Beowulf's Barrow as they steer ships across the wide and shrouded waters. So he's asking, after they burn his body, on his funeral pyre, that they bury him in a barrow um, on the coast, on the cliff, like a tower. And so people see it and say, oh, that's Beowulf. That's where he's buried. He was a great king. So people remember him. Remember back in week three when we read The Seafarer and it was like the only thing that, that lives on after you on earth is your reputation? Notes, notes, notes. Okay. 
Then the king, in his great heartedness, unclasped the collar of gold from his neck and gave it to the young thane, telling him to use it and the war shirt and the gilded helmet well. He doesn't have a son to give this to, so he's giving it to Wiglaf. You're the last of us, the only one left of the Wemendings. Fate swept us away, sent my whole high brave highborn clan to their final doom. Now I must follow them. That was the warrior's last word. Wow. Also, Beowulf just ordered Wiglaf to construct a thane, and Wiglaf is the last of Beowulf's people. Just, uh, and not to construct a thane, to construct a barrow. Just like the barrow they just got the gold out of was constructed by the last of the people. The last of those people. Parallelism? Okay, let's go to 190 at the top. Beowulf has died. He had no more to confide. The furious heat of the pyre would assail him. His soul fled from his breast to its destined place among the steadfast ones. Okay, so he's going to heaven. He's going to the stead where the steadfast people go. It was hard then on the young hero having to watch the one he held so dear there on the ground, going through his death agony. The dragon from, uh, oh, I guess the dragon hasn't disappeared. Here he is. The dragon from under earth, his nightmarish destroyer, lay destroyed as well, utterly without life. No longer would his snake folds ply themselves to safeguard hidden gold. Hard-edged blades, hammered out and keenly filed, had finished him, so that the sky roamer lay there rigid, brought low beneath the treasure lodge. Never again would he glitter and glide and show himself off in midnight air, exulting in his riches. He fell to earth through the battle's strength in Beowulf's arm. There were few, indeed, as far as I have heard, big and brave as they may have been, few who would have held out if they'd had to face the outpourings of that poison breather or gone foraging on the ring hall floor and found the deep barrow dweller on guard and awake. The treasure had been won, bought and paid for by Beowulf's death. Okay, remember one of our epic characteristics is sacrifice. Here Beowulf has sacrificed himself for the safety and security of his people. Both had reached the end of the road through the life they had been lent. Before long, the battle dodgers abandoned the wood, the ones who'd let down their lord earlier, the tail turners, ten of them together. When he needed them most, they had made off. Ooh, the poet has no time for these guys. Now they were ashamed, yeah, as they should be, and came behind shields in their battle outfits to where the old man lay. They watched Wiglaf sitting worn out, a comrade shoulder to shoulder with his lord, trying in vain to bring him round with water. Much as he wanted to, there was no way he could preserve his lord's life on earth or alter in the least the Almighty's will. What God judged right would rule what happened to every man, as it does to this day. Okay, now Wiglaf, you notice, is considered a warrior now, right? He earned his right to sit shoulder to shoulder with the great warrior Beowulf. And he's not going to take it well that these ten guys who ran away when the battle got scary, oh, now they show up? Then a stern rebuke was bound to come from the young warrior to the ones who had been cowards. Wiglaf, son of Wostan, spoke disdainfully and in disappointment. Anyone ready to admit the truth will surely realize that the Lord of men who showered you with gifts and gave you the armor you are standing in, when he would distribute helmets and mail shirts to men on the mead benches, a prince treating his thanes in hall to the best he could find, far or near, was throwing weapons uselessly away. It would be a sad waste when war broke out. Beowulf had little cause to brag about his armed guard, Yet God, who ordains who wins or loses, allowed him to strike with his own blade when bravery was needed. There was little I could do to protect his life in the heat of the fray, yet I found new strength welling up when I went to help him. 
When my sword connected and the deadly assaults of our foe grew weaker, the fire coursed less strongly from the head. But when the worst happened, too few rallied round the prince. So, it is goodbye now to all you know and love on your home ground. The open-handedness of giving war swords, every one of you with freeholds of land, our whole nation will be dispossessed. Once princes from beyond get tidings of how you turned and fled and disgraced yourselves, a warrior will sooner die than live a life of shame. He's saying, when everybody hears what you did, how you ran away, how you're cowards, they're all going to attack us. And our country's going to be ruined because you weren't brave enough. Then he ordered the outcome of the fight to be reported to those camped on the ridge, that crowd of retainers who sat all morning, sad at heart, shield bearers wondering about the man they loved. Would this be his la day be his last, or would he return? So there have been, other than this small group he took with him, there have been this whole camp of people, because remember all the, the their, their um, main buildings were burned. So they were in a camp. So there's this whole camp of people on the other side of the hill who didn't see what happened, um, who are waiting. And so Wigloff takes charge and sends back messengers and tells the truth. He told the truth and did not balk. The rider who bore news to the clifftop, he addressed them all. Now the people's pride and love, the Lord of the Geats, is laid on his deathbed, brought down by the dragon's attack. Beside him lies the bane of his life, dead from knife wounds. There was no way Beowulf could manage to get the better of the monster with his sword. Wiglaf sits at Beowulf's side, the son of Weosten, a living warrior watching by the dead, keeping weary vigil, holding awake for the loved and the loathed. Now, war is looming over our nation. Soon it will be known to Franks and Frisians far and wide that the king is gone. And remember, they didn't attack because they were scared of Beowulf. They don't give a fig about Wiglaf. Hostility has been great among the Franks since Higlock sailed forth at the head of the war fleet in Friesland, remember the previous king, where the Hetware harried and attacked and overwhelmed him with great odds. The leader in his war gear was laid low, fell among followers. That lord did not favor his company with spoils. The Merovogian king has been an enemy to us ever since. Nor do I expect peace or pact keeping of any sort from the Swedes. Remember, at Ravenswood, Ungenthau slaughtered Hethsin, Hethril's, Threthel's son, when the Geat people in their arrogance first attacked the fierce sheaflings. The return blow was, quite quick, was quickly struck by Othair's father. Old and terrible, he felled the sea king and saved his own aged wife, the mother of Onla and of Othair, bereft of her gold rings. Then he kept hard on the heels of the foe and drove them leaderless, lucky to get away, in a desperate rout into Ravenswood. His army surrounded the weary remnant where they nursed their wounds all through the night. He howled threats as though huddled survivors. Okay, why is this guy in front of these people who are just being told their king is dead, why is he bringing up all this ancient history? Well, remember about feuding, right? So he's like all these people who were kept at bay because Beowulf was so strong, are, they haven't forgotten. and They're going to come back, and they're still mad at us, and those old wounds still rankle. Basically, this is like the situation in the Middle East, right? Nobody can actually heal those wounds long term because everybody continually remembers what happened before, what happened before, what happened before, and that makes the situation now always dangerous. Okay, top of uh, 199. Promised to axe their bodies open. These are the threats that the guy was yelling at the guys in the woods. When dawn broke, dangle them from gallows to feed the birds. But at first light, when their spirits were lowest, relief arrived. They heard the sound of Higlock's horn, his trumpet calling as he came to find them, the hero in pursuit at hand with troops. The bloody swath that Swedes and Geats cut through each other was everywhere. No one could miss their murderous feuding. Then the old man made his move, pulled back, barred his people in. Ungenthau withdrew to higher ground. 
Higlock's pride and prowess as a fighter were known to the Earl. He had no confidence that he could hold out against that horde of seamen, defend wife and the ones he loved from the shock of the attack. He returned for shelter behind the earth of wall. Then Higlock swooped on the Swedes at bay. His banners swarmed into the refuge. The, his geat forces drove forward to destroy the camp. There, in his gray hairs, Ungenthau was cornered, ringed around with swords, and it came to pass that the king's fate was in Eofer's hands, and in his alone. Wolf, son of Wandred, went in for him in anger, split him open, so the blood came spurting from under his hair. The old hero still did not flinch, but parried fast, hit back with harder stroke. The king turned and took him on. Then Wanred's son, the brave wolf, could land no blow against the aged lord. Ungenthau divided his helmet, so he buckled and bowed his bloody head and dropped to the ground. But his doom held off. Though he was cut deep, he recovered again. With his brother down, the undaunted Eofer, Higelac's thane, hefted his sword and smashed murderously at the massive helmet past the lifted shield, and the king collapsed. The shepherd of people was sheared of life. Isn't that a nice combination there? Many then hurried to help Wolf, bandaged and lifted him. Now they were left masters on the blood-soaked battleground. One warrior stripped the other, looted Ungathau's iron mail coat, his hard sword hilt, his helmet too, and carried the graith to Kim, King Higlock. He accepted the prize, promised fairly that reward would come, and kept his word. For their bravery in action when they arrived home, Eofer and Wolf were overloaded by Hrethel's son, Higlock the Geat, with gifts of land and linked reins that were worth a fortune. They had won glory, so there was no gainsaying his generosity, and he gave Eofer his only daughter to bide at home with him, in honor and a bond. So, this bad blood between us and the Swedes, this vicious, vicious feud, I am convinced, is bound to revive. They will cross our borders and attack in force when they find out that Beowulf is dead. In days gone by, when our warriors fell and we were undefended, he kept our coffers and our kingdom safe right, because he mentored that young king, remember, when they didn't have a, a lord. He worked for the people, but as well as that, he behaved like a hero. We must hurry now to take a last look at the king and launch him, lord and lavisher of rings, on the funeral road. His royal pyre will melt no small amount of gold heaped here in a hoard. It was bought at heavy cost, and that pile of rings he paid for at the end with his own life will go up with the flame, be furled in fire. Treasure no more follower will wear in his memory. No lovely woman link and attach as a toque around her neck, but often, repeatedly, in the path of exile, they shall walk bereft, bowed under woe, now that their leader's laugh is silenced, high spirits quenched. Many a spear dawn cold to the touch will be taken down and waved on high. The swept harp won't waken warriors, but the raven winging darkly over the doomed will have news, tidings for the eagle of how he hoped and ate, how the wolf and he made short work of the dead. Oof, that's dark. And also echoing the, the uh, last warrior who built this barrow. This guy's saying all that treasure that Beowulf fought for that he thought was going to make our people secure, it's not. We're going to bury it with him because our people can't be secure because we're going to be attacked. We're, we're now vulnerable and, um, you know, we're, we're just going to be destroyed. Such was the drift of the dire report that gallant man delivered. He got little wrong in what he told and predicted. So eh, looks like he was right. The whole troop rose in tears, then took their way to the uncanny scene under Irnanes. There, on the sand, where his soul had left him, they found him at rest, their ring-giver from days gone by. The great man had breathed his last. Beowulf the king had indeed met with a marvelous death. But what they saw first was far stranger. The serpent on the ground, gruesome and vile, lay facing him. The fire dragon was scarcely burnt, scorched all colors. From head to tail, his entire length was fifty feet. He had shimmered forth on the night air once and then winged back down to his den, but death owned him now. He would never enter his earth gallery again. 
Beside him stood pitchers and piled up dishes, silent flagons, precious swords eaten through with rust, ranged as they had been while they waited their thousand winters underground. That huge cache, gold inherited from an ancient race, was under a spell, which meant no one was ever permitted to enter the ring hall unless God himself, man's keeper, true king of triumphs, allowed some person pleasing to him and in his eyes worthy to open the hoard. Okay, what does that tell us? Wiglaf went in and got that treasure, right? That means Wiglaf is appointed by God. He's blessed by God and he's like, he's going to take over, right? Because remember divine right of kings? Starts this early. What came about brought to nothing the hopes of the one who had wrongly hidden riches under the rock face. First, the dragon slew that man among men, who in turn made fierce amends and settled the feud. Famous for his deeds a warrior may be, but it remains a mystery where his life will end, when he may no longer dwell in the mead hall among his own. Uh, remember in the seafarer where he's like, you never know how your life is going to end? So it was with Beowulf, when he faced the cruelty and cunning of the mound guard. He himself was ignorant of how his departure from the world would happen, and the high-born chiefs who had buried the treasure declared it until doomsday so accursed that whoever robbed it would be guilty of wrong and grimly punished for their transgressions, hasped in hellbounds in heathen shrines. Yet Beowulf's gaze at the gold treasure when he first saw it had not been selfish. Remember, he's... This is why it's important that he's not going, ooh, shiny. He's going, that's protection for my people. Wiglaf, son of Weoston, spoke. Often, when one man follows his own will, many are hurt. This happened to us. Nothing we advised could ever convince the prince we loved, our land's guardian, not to vex the custodian of the gold. Let him lie where he lo was long accustomed to lurk there under earth until the end of the world. He held to his high destiny. The hoard is laid bare, but at a grave cost. It was too cruel a fate that forced the king to that encounter. I have been inside and seen everything amassed in that vault. I managed to enter, although no great welcome awaited me under the earth wall. I quickly gathered up the huge pile of precious, priceless treasures hand-picked from the hoard and carried them here where the king could see them. He was still himself, alive, aware, and in spite of his weakness, he had many requests. He wanted me to greet you and order the building of a barrow that would crown the site of his pyre, serve as his memorial, in a commanding position, since of all men that have lived and thrived and lorded it on earth, his worth and due as a warrior were the greatest. Now, let us again go quickly and feast our eyes on that amazing fortune heaped under the wall. I will show the way, and take you close to the coffers packed with rings and bars of gold. Let a buyer be made and got ready quickly when we come out and let us bring the body of our Lord, the man we loved, to where he will lodge for a long time in the care of the Almighty. Then Weoston's son, stalwart to the end, had orders given to owners of dwellings, many people of importance in the land, to fetch wood from far and wide for the good man's pyre. Now shall flame consume our leader in battle, the blaze darken round him, who stood his ground in the steel hail when the arrow storm shot from bowstrings, pelted the shield wall. The shaft hit home, feather fledged, it finned the barb in flight. Next, the wise son of Weoston called from among the king's thanes a group of seven. He selected the best and entered with them, the eighth of their number. Under the God-cursed roof, one raised a lighted torch and led the way. So these eight guys are going in to get the treasure. No lots were cast for who should loot the hoard, for it was obvious to them that every bit of it lay unprotected within the vault, there for the taking. It was no trouble to hurry to work and haul out the priceless store. They pitched the dragon over the cliff top, let tides flow and backwash take the treasure minder. They threw the dragon into the sea. Then coiled gold was loaded on a cart in great abundance, and the gray-haired leader, the prince on his buyer, born to Hronis. Okay, and then we're going to get Beowulf's funeral. The Geat people built the pyre for Beowulf, 
stacked and decked it until it was four, stood four square, hung with helmets, heavy war shields, and shining armor, just as he had ordered. Then his warriors laid him in the middle of it, mourning a lord far famed and beloved. On the height they kindled the hugest of all funeral fires. Fumes of wood smoke billowed darkly up. The blaze roared and drowned out their weeping. The wind died down, and the flames wrought havoc in the hot bone house, burning it to the core. So they've, they've burned Beowulf's body. They were disconsolate and wailed aloud for their lord's decease. A Geat woman, too, sang out in grief. With hair bound up, she unburdened herself of her worst fears, a wild litany of nightmare and lament. Her nation invaded, enemies on the rampage, bodies in piles, slavery, and abasement. Heaven swallowed the smoke. Then the Geat people began to construct a mound on the headland, high and imposing, a marker that sailors could see from far away, and in ten days they had done the work. It was their hero's memorial. What remained from the fire they housed within it, so his bones or whatever was left, his ashes, behind a wall as worthy of him as their workmanship could make it. And they buried toques in the barrow and jewels and a trove of such things as trespassing men had once dared to drag from the hoard. So they took that treasure, some of that treasure, that they pulled out of the hoard and have buried it with him. They let the ground keep that ancestral treasure, gold under gravel, gone to earth, as useless to men now as it ever was. Then twelve warriors rode around the tomb, chieftain sons, champions in battle, all of them distraught, chanting in dirges, mourning his loss as a man and a king. They extolled his heroic nature and exploits and gave thanks for his greatness, which was the proper thing. Remember when he beat Grendel and then Grendel's mother and they all came back on horseback and they were all chanting and yelling and telling stories about him? Here we've got the opposite. I mean, the same thing is happening, but for a different reason and in a very different tone. For a man should cherish a prince whom he holds dear and cherish his memory when that moment comes when he has to be conveyed from his bodily home. So the Geet people, his hearth companions, sorrowed for the Lord who had been laid low. They said that of all the kings upon the earth, he was the man most gracious and fair-minded, kindest to his people, and keenest to win fame. And that the end of Beowulf. What did you guys think? You're going to go ahead and fill out your notes and we'll have a comment section in uh, week eight and then um, we're going to get into a project and use some of the stuff we learned. All right. Thank you very much for being good listeners and good readers and I will see you next class. Bye everybody.